Uh, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Sasai, uh, president of Japan Institute for International Affairs. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to open uh, this uh, uh, joint uh, Japan-Singapore symposium. This is the 15th round of the symposium and uh, <clears throat> this is a public session. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had uh, closed sessions among the experts, and uh, there was a good debate. And of course, we discussed and addressed the regional strategic issues, including uh, Sino-American relationships, including Taiwan and so forth. And also, uh, we spent much time on the regional economic architecture, especially CPTPP. Again, uh, there was a much debate on this uh, relationship between the United States and China and also Taiwan and others. But importantly, uh, we had a good debate and also a good consensus about how Japan and Singapore can play an important role to sustain and develop this regional peace and stability and prosperity. And for many years, Japan and Singapore had been playing a positive role uh, to stabilize the region. And I'm sure that uh, in today's discussion, we would uh, address all these issues. Uh, today, we have uh, keynote speakers, uh, uh, both foreign minister, foreign minister Hayashi from Japan, and foreign minister Balakrishnan from Singapore. I'm very much looking forward to their insight uh, on the how Japan, uh, Singapore could cooperate uh, for the regional peace and stability. And uh, then <clears throat> there will be discussions uh, among the uh, uh, selected uh, uh, panel speakers. But here uh, we have a former foreign minister, Kono, uh, uh, participating, and he would uh, deliver his own keynote remarks, and he will be sitting listening and he will be participating as a commenter commentator so uh, we uh, we are very much looking forward to lively discussion uh, of course uh, at the end of, of this uh, discussion we will ask the uh, all the uh, uh, participants uh, on online and to ask questions and so forth so again uh, welcome and uh, I'm very much uh, uh, looking forward to the good debate. Ambassador Kaur, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, Konnichiwa. On behalf of the Singapore delegation, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our Japanese friends, our Singapore compatriots, and other friends who have joined this public forum. As my co-chair, Ambassador Sai said, this public forum is an extension of the 15 Japan Singapore Symposium, which was held yesterday. We are very privileged this morning to have messages from our two foreign ministers, as well as the participation of an esteemed Japanese leader, Taro Kono, Taro Kono san. Let me just briefly say that the Japan Singapore Symposium is an event which is held on track 1.5. What this means is that the two delegations consist of individuals from their respective government, from the private sector and civil society. At our closed door meeting yesterday, we had a very rich discussion of the political security landscape in the region, the regional economic development, and importantly, on our bilateral relation. I would like to add to what Ken just said, that there was an agreement between our two delegations that the Japan-Singapore bilateral relationship is in excellent order. It is warm, substantive, and trouble-free. We also agreed that we should grasp new opportunities to take this relationship forward and we, we discussed the possibility 
for the two countries to conclude an agreement to allow for the travel of our vaccinated citizen to one another's country. We also discuss the opportunities for the two countries to work closely together in areas in which we have strength, such as the digital economy, e-commerce, e-service, financial technology, the green economy, smart cities, etc. So there are many new opportunities for us to build our relationship and make it even stronger and for us to work together in the region and the world. So thank you, Ken, I will return the mic to you. Thank you, Ambassador Tommy Cole. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the uh, keynote speeches of both foreign ministers. Uh, first, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi. His Excellency, Dr. Balakrishna, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Singapore, Mr. Taro Kono, uh, Chairman of the Japan Singapore Parliamentary Friendship Leave, uh, Co Chair uh, Professor Ko, and uh, Ambassador Sasai, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Yoshimasa Hayashi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan. It is a great pleasure for me to speak at the 15th. At Japan Singapore Symposium being held here today on behalf of the government of Japan. I'd like to express our deep gratitude to the efforts of those involved on both sides. Actually, I have attended this symposium for four times since the second symposium in 1996. It is a great honor for me to be able to deliver a keynote speech as a Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs at a symposium that I hold a special interest in. Today, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on Japan-Singapore relations and the contributions of of our two countries to the region and the international community. At present, the international community is confronted with epoch-making changes, challenges to universal values and the international order, which have until now underpinned the peace and prosperity of the international community are becoming more and more apparent. In addition, economic factors are beginning to have a significant impact on security. In this situation, Japan must have the determination to fully defend universal values, to fully safeguard the peace and stability of Japan, and to contribute to humankind and take on a leadership role in the international community. With these three determinations, we will conduct diplomacy with a balanced and stable posture with a high level of readiness. It goes without saying that Singapore is an important partner for Japanese diplomacy. Even in this age of COVID-19, we have been working closely together, including among the leaders following the inauguration of the Kishida administration. I also had a teleconference with Foreign Minister Balakrishnan in December last year, and we had a very meaningful exchange of views on a wide range of issues. I'm looking forward to the day when we can meet again in person and have further in-depth discussions. Singapore has achieved remarkable developments since its independence. It is now one of the highest income countries in Asia. However, the importance of Singapore is not only its wealth, and I focus on the driving force of its development. The first is the passion for national development and its strong leadership. The second is the ability to create something out of nothing or transform a negative into a positive. The third is the active utilization of domestic and foreign talent. In order to realize peace and prosperity amidst the difficult international environment, we should learn these aspects by strengthening our relationship with Singapore. If we view the region as a whole, Singapore is located in an important strategic area facing the Strait of Malacca and serves as a hub for logistics, finance, human resources, and information. Singapore is also home to a number of leading think tanks, including the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, and has the capability to communicate internationally, including through the holding of the Shangri-La Dialogue. And as I mentioned earlier, Singapore has world-class human resources. Japan considers Singapore to be a partner that shares the responsibility of addressing the challenges facing the region and the international community. Today, the regional security environment is more challenging than ever before. 
it is clear that what is happening in the East and South China Seas is not a regional problem to be dealt only by regional players, but an issue that directly affects the values and principles of the international community. It is also important to continue to address issues related to North Korea, Myanmar, and other countries. In the area of economic security, which has emerged with the changes in economic and social conditions, there is much room for cooperation, especially in strengthening supply chains, ensuring the security of key infrastructure, and preventing technology outfall. Japan and Singapore should face these challenges together and play their respective roles. I'd like to highlight the fact that uh, based upon rule of law, Japan is promoting free and open in the Pacific region. That is initiative to create uh, the order in the free and open in the Pacific. In the meantime, uh, I would say that ASEAN is a cornerstone of implementation of that uh, the vision. At the same time, ASEAN is promoting the ASEAN outlook in the Pacific or AOIP, which has uh, common factors with FYIP. And therefore, to realize those visions, we should uh, continue to work with Singapore in the following areas. First of all, two countries share the same values or common values, rule of law, freedom of navigation, a free trade, which uh, should be spread and fully established in, in the Pacific region and eventually in the international community in various forum and venue uh, uh, involving both public and private, we hope to uh, ask Singapore for their ability to uh, disseminate such information about the vision. Second of all, we will contribute to improving the connectivity in this region. For instance, in March last year, uh, we concluded a memorandum of understanding and the infrastructure cooperation in the third country, uh, which would be developed into a concrete uh, the. The, the programs and projects, and also in order to strengthen the economic relationship in the region and develop business environment, it is essential that two countries would lead uh, in the discussion of free trade, digitalization, and climate change, among others. Japan served as a chair of TPP, CPTPP last year, and now uh, this year it is Singapore that will be the chair, and both countries should work together to maintain the high standard of CPTPP. And also, the common interest uh, of us is about the cooperation on the full implementation of RCEP agreement. Third of all, in the field of security, uh, including the port called by the uh, the self-defense forces vessels and the uh, friendship uh, the exercise, as well as the uh, recap for anti-piracy activities, uh, the two countries should continue the uh, maritime cooperation. And also through JSPP 21, uh, we should also steadily implement the technology cooperation uh, on the maritime security in the third party country. Right now, Omicron variety is uh, rampant all around the world and uh, infection uh, is spreading. Uh, and uh, this is another area that we can explore the opportunity for the cooperation. The two countries share another strength that is the human resources. And for various challenges that this region and international community are faced with, uh, with ideas coming out of those two countries, I'm certain that the advanced and effective solutions could be identified. Unfortunately, we are meeting this year again uh, and remotely, but take it positively because this is uh, they're based upon uh, the virtual or online technology. Uh, we can uh, have more audience uh, listen to our discussion. I sincerely hope that discussion at the symposium today would contribute to further development of bilateral relationship as well as friendship and cooperation relationship between Japan and ASEAN that will celebrate 50th anniversary. And also would uh, further trigger uh, the cooperation of uh, two countries for the peace and prosperity of this region and international community. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Hayashi, uh, for your powerful uh, message to advance and support uh, Japan-Singapore collaboration in the regional context and bilateral context. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the uh, remarks uh, by uh, Singaporean uh, Foreign Minister Vivian Parakushnan. Your Excellency, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Hayashi Yoshimasa, distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am delighted to address the 15th Japan-Singapore Symposium. Since its inception in 1995, the JSS has regularly brought together leading figures and opinion shapers from Singapore and Japan to exchange views on bilateral, regional, and the global issues of the day. Personally, I fondly recall attending the 11th JSS in Tokyo in 2016, where I had the privilege of delivering the keynote speech on the exact day of the 50th anniversary of the Singapore-Japan relations on the 26th of April. Singapore and Japan enjoy excellent relations, underpinned by frequent high-level exchanges, very strong economic links, and very close people-to-people -people ties. Last year marked the 55th anniversary of the Singapore-Japan diplomatic relations. Despite the onslaught of COVID-19, both our countries have kept up the momentum of high-level engagements, including the phone call between Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong and Prime Minister Kishida Fumio last November, just two months ago. I also had a very good discussion on bilateral relations and regional developments with Foreign Minister Hayashi just last month. The Speaker of our Parliament, Mr Tan Chuan Jin, and the Minister for Community, Culture and Youth, Edwin Tong, visited Tokyo last August for the Olympic and the Paralympic Games, while then Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, Kokuba Konosuke, visited Singapore in the same month. We look forward to more of such exchanges to strengthen our bilateral relations. Singapore and Japan have very robust economic linkages. The Japan-Singapore Economic Partnership Agreement is the centerpiece of our economic relations. It is Japan's first bilateral economic partnership agreement. Since its entry into force in November 2002, the JESPA has created many opportunities for businesses and enhanced the mutual attractiveness of our markets. Our economic ties today are extensive and wide-ranging, extending from traditional industries like hospitality and logistics to newer and to emerging sectors such as healthcare and precision engineering. Despite disruptions to the global supply chains and trade brought about by COVID-19, Japan has remained one of Singapore's top trading partners and Singapore continues to be a popular destination for Japanese investments. As the global economy evolves, we should actively explore even more opportunities for collaboration, especially in the emerging areas of digitalization, innovation and the green economy, as well as infrastructure cooperation in third countries. A virtual convention like the 15th JSS is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the digital capabilities of our countries. As we navigate an increasingly digitalized world, we can do far more to tap on each other's expertise to be at the forefront of technological change. Singapore's Ministry of Communications and Information signed a Memorandum of Cooperation with Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications last July to expand cooperation in areas ranging from artificial intelligence to cybersecurity. Japan's Digital Garden City Nation Initiative and Singapore's Smart Nation Initiative are highly complementary. We should tap on our common interests in creating sustainable smart cities and reinforcing cooperation in green and the digital economy in order to expand both the breadth and depth of our digital collaboration. Our countries have also deepened cooperation on the multilateral front during these times of uncertainty. Our common commitment to maintaining trade and supply chain connectivity has led to the joint statement on facilitating resilient economic activities for combating the COVID-19 pandemic. We also join hands in championing initiatives in support of vaccine multilateralism via the COVAX facility. Singapore and Japan have rolled out national vaccination drives with much success 
providing a strong foundation for our post-pandemic recovery. The endemic nature of the current virus reveals an exigency for closer collaboration to facilitate the safe resumption of travel. Japan and Singapore have always shared strong people-to-people -people relations. Japan is a very popular tourist destination among Singaporeans, while Singapore is also popular amongst Japanese travelers. Despite the bump in the road presented by the Omicron variant, Singapore remains committed to reopening our borders safely. We look forward to working very closely with Japan to promote the safe resumption of travel. In the region, Singapore and Japan are natural and like-minded partners. We share a common commitment to upholding an open and rules-based trading system and enhancing regional economic integration. As countries around the world wrestle with the growing inward-looking sentiments, the strong trust between our two countries has enabled us to work closely together, bilaterally and multilaterally, for the advancement of free and open trade. Singapore and Japan are members of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, as well as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or the RCEP. Notably, the successful conclusion of the CPTPP would not have been possible without the astute leadership of Japan. Japan has shown exceptional leadership during its chairmanship last year, leading the, world, the UK's Ascension Working Group. As the chair of the CPTPP Commission this year, Singapore looks forward to working closely with Japan in bringing the CPTPP to even greater heights. Japan is a long-standing and close partner of ASEAN. As one of ASEAN's most substantive dialogue partners, Japan has been instrumental in promoting the open, transparent and inclusive regional architecture as well as supporting ASEAN centrality. We look forward to practical cooperation in line with the joint statement on the ASEAN-Japan cooperation on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN-Japan collaboration has remained very strong amidst COVID-19. 2021 saw the further implementation of the ASEAN-Japan Economic Resilience Action Plan, as well as the deepening of the ASEAN-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Singapore also deeply appreciates the assistance Japan has provided to buttress ASEAN's fight against the COVID-19 virus, including Japan's commitment of US $50 million to the ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies and Emerging Diseases. As Singapore renews our tenure, as shepherd of the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, we would like to thank Japan for your long-standing support for the ASCN. At the third ASEAN-Japan Smart Cities High-Level Meeting in Japan last October, Japan contributed very useful insights on how ASEAN member states could successfully develop smart cities. We look forward to Japan's continued support for the ASCN in the years ahead. ASEAN and Japan cooperation is wide-ranging spanning a range of areas from trade to climate change and security-related issues. Japan has been a key player in helping to strengthen the supply chains between Japan and ASEAN as we collectively mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. We should also maintain the momentum of ASEAN-Japan collaboration in areas such as digital solutions and trade facilitation as we work to place Singapore, Japan and our region on a fast track to comprehensive recovery. As ASEAN and Japan commemorate the 50th anniversary of dialogue relations next year, I look forward to strengthening our cooperation to propel our relations to even greater heights. The successful conclusion of the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympic Games last August notwithstanding the considerable difficulties brought about by COVID-19, was a potent symbol of hope for a post-pandemic normalcy. While the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics may have drawn to a close, its theme, moving forward, 
remains ever so relevant as we continue to forge a path of recovery. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the JSS and its long history of open and robust exchanges reflect the well-established and tightly knit relationship between our countries. My ambassador in Tokyo, Peter Tan, told me that Foreign Minister Hayashi had previously attended earlier editions of the JSS as a young parliamentarian. Foreign Minister Hayashi's video message and chair of the Japan-Singapore Parliamentary Friendship League and former Foreign Minister Kono Taro's attendance today is testimony of the strong and long links that they have with the JSS. I'm confident that our discussions over these two days will provide very useful insights and more constructive ideas to further strengthen our cooperation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Minister Balak Shishinan, uh, uh, for your uh, powerful uh, reminder and also uh, introducing us the uh, great potential uh, for Japan-Singapore collaboration, uh, not only in terms of uh, bilateral and regional, but also global. And they are indeed multifaceted and, uh, and uh, required a concerted of effort of two giant intellectual leaders, I hope. Uh, and uh, now uh, I'd like to uh, proceed uh, uh, to, to the uh, panelist uh, introductions of the thought, if I may. No? Okay. Well, let me uh, introduce uh, a Japanese uh, uh, panelist uh, uh, from a Japanese site. Uh, Dr. Tsutomu Kikuchi, you are on the line, okay. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, prof uh, Dr. Kikuchi is a professor of Aoyama Gakuin University and also senior adjunct fellow Japan Institute for International Affairs. Uh, and he is an uh, active participant uh, to the uh, regional issues and uh, very helpful. And now I have uh, uh, Professor Simon Tay uh, from Singaporean side. Mm. Are you here? Okay. Um, he is uh, chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, also active participant uh, to the debate. And uh, I have uh, Dr. Uh, Saori Katada. You're there? Okay, uh, she is a professor of uh, University of Southern California, also adjunct fellow of Japan Institute for International Affairs. Now, uh, from Singaporean side, I have uh, Mr. Manu Bashkalan. Are you there? Okay. Uh, the, uh, he's the uh, founding director and CEO of uh, Centennial uh, <clears throat> Asia Advisors. Council members. He is a uh, uh, Singapore uh, Institute of uh, International Affairs. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And I also would like to uh, introduce uh, Minister Connor. I see your face. Are you ready uh, to participate? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Connor. You look great. You got some weight? <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, are you ready to, to, to speak? Uh, before uh, coming to the discussions uh, uh, by the participant, I'd sure. like to ask you to speak and introduce what you think about uh, uh, this uh, region and uh, bilateral collaboration between Japan and Singapore. If Thank I, you. Yes, please, Minister Kono. Well, Ambassador Tommy Cole, Ambassador Sasai, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kono Taro, and uh, I have succeeded uh, Mr. Shiozaki as the chairperson 
of the Japan-Singapore Parliamentary Friendship League last December. I used to live and work in Singapore. I remember I was working in an office on Shenton Way when it was next to the beach. And uh, I remember eating lunches at the old Lao Pasa market and uh, where no tourists came then. The Merlion stood at the mouth of Singapore River and the zoo was open only during the day. There were two terminals at the Changi Airport and uh, one causeway to visit Malaysia. I feel like I'm an old man. But uh, I have returned to Singapore many times since. And uh, most recently, I came to Singapore at the end of 2020 as Minister for Administrative Affairs. I was deeply, deeply impressed by the digital transformation of the Singapore government. You just need a smartphone to do business with the government and the private sector. It is very easy to use and you do not have to memorize a dozen or more password. So we have established the digital agency in Japan and uh, now we are trying hard to catch up now. Well, I also would like to tell you that uh, I am the honorary chairperson of the JDPA, Japan Durium Promotion Association. We are now not only trying to grow durians in Okinawa, but also developing something tastier than Musan King so we can export to you in Singapore. Well, I'm delighted to participate in this symposium today. Needless to say, Japan and Singapore are enjoying friendly relationship. And as the chairperson of the Japan-Singapore Parliamentary Friendship League, I truly look forward to further deepening relations with Singapore, a country which keeps on moving with a pioneering spirit, even in the difficult times of increased uncertainty. Now, let me share my basic views on the theme of this session, uh, namely Japan-Singapore partnership in regional cooperation. I believe that fundamental values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law and the rule-based international order are being exposed to serious challenges. Japan and Singapore, which have been benefiting from those fundamental values and the liberal international order, uh, expected to step up and fulfill the role to defend them. Like-minded countries, including Japan and Singapore, should raise the voices in a concerted manner and stand up against any countries that are challenging the values and the order and make them pay high cost for that. There are also um, some voices of concern, especially among Southeast Asia and South Asia countries about the military expansion of China. We have seen the border conflicts with India and with Bhutan, conflicts in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, and the rising tension over the Taiwan Strait. We need to work with the United States and the regional systems, such as the Quad and the AUKUS, to preserve the balance in the region. We have also worked hard to establish the TPP. Unlike uh, the RCEP, which is a regional trade agreement, the TPP was supposed to lead rulemaking for the economies of the Indo-Pacific region. It was very unfortunate that our United States left the regime 
but we need to continue working on the American people to make them see the need for it. Japan has been promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Whenever I visited foreign countries across the world as a minister for foreign affairs, I made a point of explaining in detail of Japan thinking on free and open Indo-Pacific and promoting economic and security cooperation projects in a way that would benefit each country. As a result, the vision of free and open Indo-Pacific has achieved broad support from many countries in the international community. The ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific shares many fundamental principles with free and open Indo-Pacific. Japan intends to materialize the both visions while emphasizing ASEAN centrality and unity. It is also important to jointly promote cooperation, not only in tackling COVID-19, but also in fields such as green, digital, and third country infrastructure cooperation in a way that would benefit the region. I strongly hope that today's session is going to provoke some thinking out of the box and provide meaningful discussions on how Japan and Singapore can contribute to peace and the prosperity of the region. And I would love to come to Singapore for the next round of this meeting. So thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. And, th and thank you, Minister Kono, uh, for very insightful uh, remarks uh, about the uh, collaborations uh, between Japan and Singapore in various aspects. And uh, oh, sure, uh, there will be a lot of uh, interesting questions about uh, what you said. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, uh, for <coughs> uh, two preceding remarks by the uh, ministers, foreign ministers of both countries. But uh, before doing that, uh, I'd like to, if I may, uh, first uh, introduce uh, Japanese uh, discussant uh, to speak. And uh, I would like to ask them uh, to speak, uh, uh, not so long, but uh, to the point, hopefully. Now, first, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Tsutomu Kikuchi to, to make uh, remarks. Law is yours, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Sasai. And good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Kikuchi. Uh, great uh, pleasure and honor to speak uh, at the this, you know, Japan Singapore public uh, seminar. And uh, in my uh, presentation, I would uh, discuss the Japan and Singaporean cooperation to maintain the so-called rule-based order in the in the Pacific. But already, uh, uh, Minister Kono uh, pointed out the rule-based rule orders are being challenged right now. The, I would focus the on three aspects in approaching this, how to deal with you know, the, the challenges. First, our relation with the United States. The second, our approach to China. And thirdly, uh, how to deal with regional architecture for cooperation, especially the relation between Quad, US, Japan, Australia, India's, uh, you know, the dialogue format and ASEAN. First is ASEAN, uh, uh, our relation with the uh, United States. Firstly, you know, the stable balance of power is an essential condition for maintaining the rule-based orders. With China's uh, increasing powers and assertive behaviors, continued involvement of the United States in the region is indispensable. Through the alliance with the United States, Japan has been supporting US involvement and balance of powers 
in the regions. To be noted in this regard is Japan's recent uh, quite proactive uh, initiative to enhance, to maintain the US engagement in the region through our alliance with the United States. But Singapore also has been playing a major role to keep US engaged in the regions through provision of uh, facilities uh, to the US Army, US military, and also conclusion of a free trade agreement and so forth. So this means the Japan-US alliance and Singapore-US relations constitute an uh, integral part of the rule-based order of these regions. And now US has serious domestic problems. And it is essential for US other Asian countries, including Japan, Singapore, make further self-help effort to support US continued engagement in the regions. So I mentioned uh, later on the cooperation between Quad and ASEAN. And Quad, in my understanding, serve as an additional instrument to keep US engaged in the regions. The challenges are facing our regions are diverse. And so-called China problem is not the only challenges we are facing. So it is important for Japan and Singapore to encourage the US to ensure that Indo-Pacific policy does not become a derivative of US-China policies. So US should be encouraged to go beyond the uh, China uh, problems. And I would move to a second aspect, our approach to China. So Japan and Singapore are two countries that have quite skillfully managed the balance between competition and cooperation with China. So this can be characterized as a sense of balance between, on the one hand, firmly opposed, opposing China's action that violate international rules. But at the same time, both countries have been maintaining cooperative relation with China. So we, Japan and Singapore have been uh, standing up to China, but simultaneously get along with China. So partnership between Japan and Singapore can provide useful diplomatic wisdom and lessons for the countries in the regions on how to deal with assertive China. And Japan and Singapore should construct a web of regional network to encourage China to act in accordance with the rules of international communities. And immediate most important issues is how to respond to China's application for us 11 countries uh, uh, CPTPP. And China's behavior in areas such as uh, international trade and investment is a quite pro 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 problematic. And the close consultation between Japan and Singapore is important to correct China's behavior through CPTPP accession negotiations. It's also desirable to uh, some con close consultation between Japan, uh, Singapore, and uh, such area like uh, uh, Mekong River uh, Development Program and so forth. The Mekong region has a huge potential to become uh, quite uh, prosperous subregions, but at the same time, that become an area for 
great power politics competition between great power, uh, great powers, and further this this destabilizing the subdivisions. So I move to uh, the final aspect, the relation between Quad and ASEAN. So institutional resilience of ASEAN is indispensable for rules-based Indo-Pacific orders. After the end of the, the Cold War, many institutions of regional cooperation centered on ASEAN were established, including ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus uh, 3, Japan, China, South Korea, and also uh, East Asian uh, Summit. In recent years, however, we have seen the creation of a mechanism for cooperation by small number of countries, not including ASEAN, so called the developing of mini lateral arrangement. These include Quad, the also uh, AUKUS, AUKUS consisting of US, UK, and Australia. And the trilateral cooperation uh, formats have been emerging, including Japan, US, Australia, Japan, US, India, Australia, India, France, and, and so forth. And Quad is not alliance, as some countries call it, nor is it likely to become alliance in foreseeable futures. However, Quad has the potential to develop into a mechanism for regional cooperation that is more resilient and more powerful than alliance. The quad uh, comparative advantage is rising its institutional flexibilities and also uh, public natures of agenda. It's now being uh, uh, addressed. The first, uh, quad is multi-layered uh, mechanisms among four countries. So quad is a, a mechanism for cooperation among four parties, but it is also supported by bilateral, trilateral cooperation among four countries. So bilateral and trilateral uh, cooperations among uh, four parties constitute uh, essential building blocks to cooperation among four Quad countries. And Quad is also open to all non Quad members. So called, so -called Quad Plus a scheme is much layered, much dimensional cooperative mechanism, including uh, non Quad members, partners. The second, Quad seek to address a wide range of challenges facing rule-based orders uh, of the Indo-Pacific, including vaccine supply, infrastructure, supply chain, resilience, maritime security, and advanced uh, technologies. So Quad uh, is aiming at providing so-called public goods to enhance rule-based orders. So in the context of Quad, uh, concept of Indo-Pacific is not the concept of confrontation, but of cooperation and collaborations. So I, finally, I would touch upon the cooperation between Quad and ASEAN. And Quad could provide the appropriate regional environment for ASEAN's initiative in the Indo-Pacific to better function. The Quad could contribute to make, maintaining, as I mentioned, uh, the balance of powers in the regions. This is an essential condition for ASEAN-related 
regional institutions to work. So Quad could provide a, a, a format for addressing the challenges of maintaining and uh, maintaining a rule-based regional orders. And actually, already uh, Minister Kono mentioned, pointed out, there are uh, similarities in objective and issues to be addressed within uh, ASEAN's approach to Indo-Pacific that is shown in uh, ASEAN's uh, outlook on Indo-Pacific and Quad. And cooperation between Quad and ASEAN would also be beneficial in making ASEAN outlook in on Indo-Pacific and uh, truly ASEAN project rather than uh, Indonesian uh, project. So I hope that Japan, Singapore, uh, we jointly uh, explore the possible way, ways of cooperation between uh, Quad and ASEAN uh, member countries. Thank you very much. I would stop here. Thank you for listening. Uh, so thank you, uh, Kikuchi Sensei. I take note of uh, very interesting observations of yours. Uh, that would include things like uh, you think the nature of the cut is to keep the United States engaged. Yeah. And uh, it would also help for the ASEAN to work in terms of uh, a balance of the power in the region. I think that surely there will be that, some debate on that one. And I also take note of the fact that uh, Sino-American relationship cannot be surely depend upon US and China. And there should be some others to play the role. And for that, I, uh, I, um, I take note of the fact that uh, you think that the, uh, there are issues that we have to be against China, but also we have to maintain the relationship with China. And, uh, and also it was very interesting that uh, you, uh, you said that, uh, uh, you know, China could uh, revise uh, some of the, their own economic system by the accession negotiation to TPP. That is based upon the assumption that uh, China could be accommodated. Again, there could be debate on that one. Mm. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, the uh, Professor Simon Tay. Mm. Uh, sir, you have the floor. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. Sesan. Thank you to the co-chairs and also to Minister Kono. Uh, Singapore and Japan have really enjoyed excellent relations. And the relationship with the new Kishida administration has shown this, taking off quickly from a very strong base. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Japan-Singapore Economic Partnership Agreement, Japan's first bilateral, and Singapore's first bilateral with any major economy. It sparked many FTAs and really more than that, politically helped signal the closer integration of our region and I was honored to be part of that team of the Singapore side 20 years ago. On this anniversary this year, I asked the question, can Singapore and Japan step up their strong relationship to again offer an example for the region? I'll talk a little bit about politics and then move on to some areas of more political economy. In terms of the political security issues, I think I want to underline how international law and peaceful settlement disputes is critical to both Japan and Singapore to uphold. These apply to many concerns regarding the situation of our region, such as North Korea, the South China Sea, and of course, cross-strait relations. I believe both countries share the position that what we desire to see must be achieved by peaceful means and in accordance with international law. On the South China Sea disputes, which of course should include the provisions of UNCLOS. I also hope that the code of conduct being negotiated between ASEAN and China might see progress to completion and in substance be consistent with international law. On North Korea, 
in the recent actions of Pyongyang, Singapore and ASEAN as a whole, of course, stand at a great distance from the situation. But I would say we support the concerns that Japan has expressed. There's been discussion about US-led initiatives. And of course, we understand Japan as an ally has been signaling close alignment with the Quad and Indo-Pacific since the Abe administration, and it continues. This is foundational for Japan. Let me share a few words of how I see Singapore's position. We also are a good friend of the US and believe in stepping up engagement with the Biden administration that we share in common. But our considerations in relation to these new US-led initiatives, what Kui Sun referred to as the minilaterals, non-ASEAN, differ. This is because, first, we are cautious about any anti-China sentiments that do not acknowledge the interdependence. This is because of the priority. Secondly, we must give to ASEAN, to which we belong, and its role in the region over arrangements that exclude ASEAN and might confine the group to a peripheral role. So I hope that what Kuchisan has said, that these are compatible and complementary, will become true. Japan has a big influence to play in this, moving ahead with both the US and also, I hope, ASEAN. I hope that ASEAN continues to show relevance in both policy and practice to Japan. And in this sense, I call on Japan to do both, not to sacrifice ASEAN for Quad or conversely, but to do both. Moreover, where Japan's ASEAN's existing relationships are augmented, this should not be seen as anti-China, but really for the value of ASEAN itself. On a related issue, we note the increased mention of Taiwan among US and also Japanese politicians. Singapore continues to engage Taiwan, but I believe we will be mindful to maintain the one China policy and not encourage initiatives that could potentially run counter to that or even somehow raise cross-straits tensions. Some other ASEAN members will be even more cautious in relation to Taiwan. Let me turn to another political issue regarding Myanmar. Cambodia, the ASEAN chair at present, has said that Myanmar military could be allowed back to ASEAN meetings and summits, but Singapore and others have expressed some caution and call for additional efforts and progress before this. There is no otherwise no meaningful concession, and therefore there should be no change in the five-point consensus that ASEAN has reached. As for the ASEAN Special Envoy, it is unclear at present whether he will or she will have access to all parties. And so therefore, while we realistically understand that the Tatmadaw has been a major force in the country since independence, the present reality is that the NLD and its leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, must also be consulted if there's any meaningful, legitimate, and durable settlement. So in this sense, I hope that Japan will support the ASEAN five-point consensus. Like Japan, Singapore is a major investor and long-term friend to Myanmar. I want to emphasize this. There should be room for the two countries, Singapore and Japan, to discuss and to try and form policies that can be mutually support these efforts for a positive outcome in Myanmar. If and when conditions allow, I think the resumption of business investment will need to be predicated on ethical business practices. And we therefore hope to find common ground and help each other deal with a very difficult and potentially long-lasting problem. Allow me from here to move on to more about the regional political economy. Our two countries, are among the leading economies of the region, even if not the largest in size, in many areas of sophistication and technology. This was true in Jasper, it is true today. Allow me to offer some points about the regional political economy where our two countries might consider closer cooperation. The CPTPP has been mentioned repeatedly. Singapore is currently in the coordinating role and we face the expressions of interest by a number of countries, including the UK, Taiwan, and China. I note that some Japanese lawmakers have expressed support for Taiwan's bid to join the agreement. 
I do know that the CPTPP should be open and inclusive, but this is subject to two conditions. First, the quality of the undertakings must be maintained. Second, any applicant country must show itself to be willing, able to con comply with the obligation. So that's the first one. Second, that there must be a consensus among existing members to admit the applicant. And these applications will be controversial in terms of the strategy and politics. We cannot be blind to this, especially regarding China and also Taiwan. It is comforting that in the WTO and APEC, both are members. But of course, the dynamics today has changed. For the CPTPP, I think it would be ideal to subordinate the current turbulent politics to a more rational examination of questions of quality and consensus. In this context, rather than political statements by various lawmakers, a more measured course of action in the short term would be to study an expert and independent study on suitability of each applicant regarding the quality of its ability to make those commitments. The digital economy has been referred to many times. I think if one was to take a drink every time what's mentioned, the word digital, we all have to rush off from this call. But I think this is where many voices show the wisdom of this. There is much potential. I want to say from Singapore's side that we are already moving ahead with digital economic agreements with China, Chile and New Zealand and Australia. We finished the talks with UK and South Korea. Therefore, if we are all minded that digitization is a strength, not just for Singapore, but also Japan, we should again hope that Japan will consider a digital agreement, economy agreement with Singapore. As with Jasper two decades ago, this could be another significant spark for us and the wider region. Otherwise, these efforts with other countries I've mentioned will not wait. Can Japan play a digital role? I believe it can. Will it is the big question that I hope the Japanese will answer in the coming months. Can Japan play a leading role in climate change? Here again, I believe that many statements coming from the Japanese government show it can. The Japanese commitment to decarbonize Asia is critical and funding is being provided with Prime Minister Kishida pledging at COP26 over 70 billion US dollars over the next five years. This is very welcome. Singapore too will do what we can to help the region. One of the issues will be about the transition of energy and for Japan to address its reliance on coal and instead make contributions in this region through solar and other suitable technologies. Let me conclude. There needs to be continuity in ASEAN-Japan relations, whatever the governments that come. And in the face of crisis, such as downturns, pandemics, and political turmoil, like the situation in Myanmar, the Japan-Singapore partnership is really a steady pillar within ASEAN and for the region. As we recover from the pandemic, I hope Japan can engage ASEAN and Singapore as our own country renews our efforts to be a hub for the wider region. The SWI think tank that I chair served as a knowledge partner to Singapore's officially appointed Emerging Stronger Task Force. This task force recommended that Singapore businesses foster partnerships with regional neighbours. And our own report called New Horizons highlights this further. This will not just be for government to government, but among companies. And this is not simply among Singapore companies, but many of the multinationals based here in Singapore, including, of course, many of the major Japanese nationals, multinationals. 20 years ago, with Jesper, our two countries stepped forward together. It is my hope we can do so again. Thank you very much, co chairs. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Tay, uh, for your remarks. Uh, I, uh, I recognize, thank you for reminding us uh, of 20 years anniversary of Japan-Singapore uh, FTA agreement. You said that this could be example. And in that context, uh, you again uh, proposed uh, to have a bilateral 
digital agreement. Uh, this has been addressed many times uh, yesterday too. So uh, possibly we could uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, today again. Uh, the, uh, you talked about uh, digital, uh, uh, sorry, American uh, <clears throat> uh, unilateralism of the thought and uh, uh, anti-China sentiment uh, is difficult to swallow uh, for many ASEAN countries uh, while, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Taiwan issue is a bit cautious, uh, even uh, compared to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Singapore's uh, uh, good relationship with Taiwan. And uh, you expressed your hope that uh, the uh, uh, Myanmar uh, the dealing uh, will be uh, supported, especially five, uh, five points of ASEAN. Uh, I'm sure that the Japan is willing to go along with, uh, with ASEAN on this one. But uh, I think most uh, importantly, you talked uh, again about uh, regional uh, collaborations, uh, CPTTP, and um, you talked about the quality and consensus. If these two are met, uh, possibly your opinion is that uh, we should to go along uh, with Chinese and to think about how we will get uh, Taiwan into the process. Again, there will be debate on that one, especially on the geopolitical point of view. Now, I'd like to uh, ask uh, uh, Professor Katada Taoli uh, to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor to, honor to be here. And uh, thank you again, Ambassador Sasai, for uh, inviting me in, in this uh, distinguished panel. And it's an honor to be in the presence of uh, uh, Minister Aso and Ambassador uh, Cole, too. So uh, what I would like to speak in this, uh, in this session, in this short time that I, I'm allocated, is to discuss uh, the uh, the kind of uh, the implications of the US, uh, sorry, Japan-Singapore relationship. Obviously, it's been already mentioned uh, quite several times and with the emphasis that the bilateral relationship between uh, Singapore and Japan has been uh, very uh, excellent. And so that's my focus would be how these, this excellent uh, relationship have implications on the regional economic order uh, in three aspects of it. So focusing one on the rule-based order that uh, uh, this is helping to uh, establish and maintain. The other is to the issues of connectivity and economic growth, which is uh, getting increasingly, well, it's been always important, but it's been increasingly important in the aftermath of the COVID. So post-COVID growth is uh, another element. And finally, I would like to kind of uh, put a focus on the, uh, the resilience and the peace, peacefulness in the, in the region. So let me start with the uh, first aspect how, as to how Singapore and Japan uh, strong relationship contribute to the uh, regional economic order. So I would like to focus on, um, many people have already put this on the table, but focus on the trade and investment agreement where the like-minded countries like Japan and Singapore, which has a very significant weight in the regional economy, has a, a strong, uh, become a strong uh, foundation for this rule-based order. Obviously, the decade of 2020s started out with uh, many, many important opportunities and maybe some challenges when it comes to economic cooperation and, and building of economic order in, in this region. Uh, the 2020 is the conclusion of RCEP and as of January of this year, RCEP, which is the one th uh, which covers one third of the global GDP, the largest in the world at this point, uh, has come into effect. This covers a significant part of the supply chain, which is cri critical for the growth and prosperity of th this region uh, is being achieved. So this is uh, really a, a major achievement for this region. Meanwhile, CPTPP, which Japan led in the past, in the, in the in the uh, few years ago and now uh, is already in effect, is facing uh, quite a significant interest and expansion. Obviously, all that is already mentioned, I'm not going to repeat, but many of the, the, the parties are interested in joining. 
thirdly, the kind of third part of this is the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, which Simon has just mentioned. Uh, this is uh, really a very important component of the economy, the global and regional economy moving forward. Obviously, the agreement with Singapore and Chile and New Zealand have already come into effect, where now a lot of members, uh, a, a lot of the outside members are, are getting interested. Obviously, Japan is not part of this agreement yet. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of encouragement on the part of Singapore for Japan to join. While Japan is the promoter of so-called uh, data free flow, uh, free flow with trust, which was uh, agreed upon in uh, G20 Osaka summit. So that's called the Osaka, Osaka track. So all in all, uh, all, in all those agreements, Singapore and Japan are the like-minded partners which shoulder the high quality, kind of shoulder the, the kind of uh, enforcement and, and establishment of high quality economic governance. And it tackles, uh, you know, tackles in the future of many of the economic challenges uh, ranging from digital economy, sustainable growth, and in the Indo-Pacific. Overall, uh, this will be a, a big task but I think these are two wonderful partners to uh, let allow these uh, environment of the rule-based economic order to move forward. Obviously the issue of China's application is a challenge, but hopefully uh, at, or both, both in uh, CPTPP and, and DIPA, but uh, I would like to see uh, Japan uh, work with Singapore and other members to maintain the high level in this uh, rule-based order. The second part is the uh, connectivity and the re acceleration of uh, regional growth through, especially through quality infrastructure investment. Obviously, this has been the pillar for Japan of the uh, Indo of, uh, free and open in the Pacific. And this is how uh, this is going to continue. In some ways, this has gotten a significant traction, not only uh, within the region, but beyond. Obviously, uh, the Blue Dot Network, uh, which was established in 2019, was uh, spearheaded by the United States uh, with uh, Australia and Japan uh, really a uh, uh, full, full member and pushing forward. And uh, B3, uh, sorry, B3W, so Build Back Better World, uh, which was uh, uh, announced in a G7 summit uh, last year, is the kind of uh, uh, follow up both from the uh, American domestic uh, interest and also the global application of American, American infrastructure uh, investment focus. So all in all, uh, these are important efforts and this will be much you know, more important, more so in the post uh, COVID environment where growth strategies needed. Uh, in that sense, the third country cooperation between Japan and Singapore would really be important component of, of this effort where they could work, uh, work on the sustainable and resilient infrastructure uh, and collaborate in issues like the smart city, or, uh, especially in the kind of context of ASEAN as well as bilateral relations. Uh, obviously the bankability of these infrastructure projects are, are crucial, but this might be a way for many, much of the excess capital that's out in the rich economies would be utilized for the uh, sorely needed uh, capital demands in emerging economies and uh, would be an uh, engine for the future growth. Thirdly, in terms of the resilience and uh, resilience of economies in peaceful region, oh, I would like to admit that there are challenges uh, in the region, uh, quite significant abundance of challenges existing out there. I think the major one these days that everybody uh, is focusing on is the the tension between economic interdependence and the weaponization of such interdependence by not only China, but various other countries, uh, including the United States, but also the management of US-China tensions in the, not only the security field, but economic field. Obviously, uh, since the COVID, uh, the supply chain disruption, disruption and all these uh, challenges have been put on the, uh, on the uh, front burner. In that sense, the strong rules and coalition building that Singapore and Japan has managed in, in the Indo-Pacific context uh, of the prosperous region is, uh, uh, will be a con vital contribution. Both of uh, Singapore and Japan are here in the region to provide regional public goods. So these are public goods is kind of a very flimsy, probably uh, concept, but this is a very sorely needed environment element where US 
uh, due to its uh, domestic politics mostly, has been uh, quite uh, falling short in terms of its presence and the leadership. So these are items like financial contribution, technology, knowledge rules, uh, green and uh, digital economy. All those things could be the ones that uh, both countries are willing to uh, pitch in and to provide. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, basically note that despite of these, uh, uh, you know, so uh, to note that these are the important issues. And one kind of uh, key concern that everybody or uh, quite a few people are mentioning is that even though Japan has had a quite significant uh, success in leadership, in concluding CPTPP and, and RCEP, as well as the infrastructure, quality infrastructure investment and, and so on. But nowadays there's some level of concern where along with many other countries, Japan is not the only one, but with COVID, with uh, economic challenges, Japan is turning inward. So there are you know, quite a few examples being put on the table where there's high restriction on travel or uh, uh, kind of uh, insisting on coal fire plants, as well as some reshoring, reshoring efforts of some of the supply chains and so on and so forth. In that context, I would like to uh, conclude with the note that the, this, the importance of Singapore-Japan interaction and, and uh, relationship Singapore is uh, uh, could be could be and I think has been a catalyst for Japan to proactively engage in this rule-based uh, economic order in the Indo-Pacific. Now, Sim Singapore has the sense of balance, sense of openness, a sense of communication, uh, and that level of uh, kind of sophistication with the kind of like-mindedness with Japan. It would be uh, a you know, this strong bilateral relationship between Japan and Singapore would be a very ideal or suitable partner to put Japan out there and encourage it to, to be as proactive, as strong leader in the region. So I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katada Sensei. Um, uh, the, I, um, I recognize uh, the, uh, your remarks on CPTTP that uh, the, in that context, uh, you, you again, uh, uh, talked uh, much about uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, economic partnership agreement, uh, uh, and uh, and also infrastructure issues. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you talked about uh, uh, U.S. Uh, domestic uh, uh, policy component and international component, uh, the potential for uh, the Japan Singapore collaboration on that aspect. That also go to. Uh, resiliency issues but in this context I, um, I, I, I I take note of the fact that you kind of warn uh, the, the Japanese uh, inward looking uh, tendency amid the COVID-19 including travel restrictions and some others and thank you very much there will be much debate about those points now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Bashkalan to speak so you have the floor Thank you, Ambassador Sase san and a very good morning to Ambassador Ko, Minister Kono san my respected fellow panelists and distinguished guests. I recognize that we are uh, short of time, so I will go straight into the three areas that I want to talk about. I've been asked by the organizers to comment on how Japan and Singapore can cooperate within the ASEAN region. There are three areas. First, I think we can work together to help ensure that ASEAN economies realize the capacity to accelerate economic growth. ASEAN's fundamentals have improved in recent years, and there is a good chance that ASEAN could regain the role it once had as one of the most preeminent destinations for foreign capital in the 1990s. <clears throat> um, infrastructure programs are being put in place. <clears throat> there have been considerable reform efforts like Indonesia's omnibus bill, and there have been very interesting and powerful <clears throat> uh, initiatives to create <clears throat> new growth engines, such as Thailand's Eastern Economic Corridor. In addition, we also have the likely movement of production from China to ASEAN. <clears throat> However, there are still some gaps, and this is where Japan and Singapore can come in. The two nations can work together to ease the constraints that could still hold back uh, the region. 
in particular infrastructure. Uh, both our countries are capital surplus countries with well-developed financial markets, and they can help to channel funds to improve the financing capacity within the regional governments for infrastructure. So for instance, we could set up <clears throat> infrastructure trusts akin to the real estate investment trusts that have done very well in our two equity markets. These could be created and listed in Tokyo and Singapore and help raise capital for infrastructure in the region. <clears throat> However, it should be said that one of the main constraints on implementing infrastructure projects is not just capital, but also weak project management, implementation, and the failure sometimes to provide the right frameworks to incentivize the private sector to build infrastructure. This could pertain to uh, road tolls, pricing, as well as the pricing of electricity tariffs, for example. So together, <clears throat> our countries, which have considerable expertise in these matters, can provide the advice and policy support, which would ensure that the infrastructure constraint is truly eased and growth can accelerate to all our benefit. The second area where we can cooperate <clears throat> is to help ASEAN become more resilient to the greater financial turbulence that we expect. As the Fed tightens and the US dollar strengthens, there will be changes in the risk appetite of uh, global capital. And this could lead to great turbulence affecting our external positions as well as the currencies of the region. While the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralized, supported by an excellent ASEAN plus three macroeconomic research office is in place, countries typically do not seem keen to access the CMIM. The funding amounts appear to be too low, and there is still some degree of stigma associated with fulfilling IMF conditionalities, which is a requirement. And the funding application process is said to be too complicated. Therefore, Japan and Singapore can work together to make a joint proposal on revamping the CMIM to make it more attractive and more usable to countries in need. This would entail further easing the condition that requires securing IMF co-financing and conditionality. <clears throat> the two nations could also put in place contingency plans for supporting vulnerable ASEAN countries. There could be more and larger bilateral swaps as well, or even the creation of a new facility funded by the two countries to support the region in case the regional currencies and external positions come under pressure. I foresee a period <clears throat> over the next year where the gradual tightening of monetary policy, not just in the United States, but also in the other large economies, coupled with rising concerns about geopolitics and the economic prospects in China, could result in substantial dislocations in capital markets to the disadvantage of the region. Hence, the importance of addressing this vulnerability. Third, both countries can help speed up ASEAN economic integration. ASEAN economic integration has made progress, but that progress is still slow relative to its potential. In some areas, it has been quite disappointing. And without creating a true single market where production, where goods and capital and services can flow freely across borders, the case for foreign direct investment into ASEAN could be compromised. We cannot compete effectively with the other large economies like China and India, unless ASEAN gets its act together in this area. So as we did with RCEP and with CPTPP, Japan and Singapore could work together to perhaps nudge ASEAN integration forward. There have been many grand scale, top down ASEAN integration initiatives like the ASEAN Economic Community and the Mekong Subregion Growth uh, <clears throat> Framework. And some of them have been quite successful. But what we should try to advocate now is I think more practical, what I call bite-sized integration efforts, such as promoting cross-border trade and investment in some sub-regions. An example could be the Iskandar Singapore sub-region that had been advocated some time ago uh, by Malaysia for the southern part of the peninsula of Malaysia 
to integrate more <clears throat> with the Sing Singapore economy. Or we could work together to revive the, the larger Singapore Johor Riau growth triangle, uh, which in its heyday was uh, seen as a boon, uh, not just for the two countries, but also for the multinational countries, companies that were investing in this region. A joint proposal by Japan and Singapore would be more powerful in this respect than individual proposals by one or two of us. In conclusion, I just want to say that I hope these uh, ideas will be of some use as we think of how our two countries can work together for the betterment of ASEAN. ASEAN's growth potential is considerable, and if we can tap this potential and unleash it, it is something that both our countries will benefit from tremendously. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bashkalan, uh, especially uh, uh, for reminding us the importance of uh, bilateral collaboration on, on the building up of the regional infrastructure. And uh, <clears throat> I, I take note of your statement on, on, on the necessity to prepare for the future financial turbulence in the region, including the impact of U.S. Uh, monetary policy and economic situation, and even a Chinese problem. Uh, now, uh, I, um, I also uh, take note of the fact that uh, you stress on the importance of ASEAN economic integration uh, in, uh, to further uh, you know, deepen uh, the uh, capacity for ASEAN to cope uh, with uh, uh, future uh, troubles and the future, realize the future potential. Uh, now, thank you very much. Uh, these are uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, each discussion to make uh, pre presentation. Now, uh, combined all these, uh, we like to uh, go into the discussion first. Uh, if I may, would like to ask uh, Minister Connor uh, to make a comment or express your opinions, uh, if I may, uh, because you have uh, some limit of time. So, possibly. Uh, you are given the first privilege to, to speak of the thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, unlike the cold, cold War days, Chinese economy is uh, integrated into the global economy. So we cannot contain or exclude China from the international order. But uh, they need to know uh, they cannot have one China policy while crushing uh, two system in one country uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, if they wanted to keep the one China policy, they need to give Hong Kong back their freedom and democracy. Uh, they, they, can, they cannot have uh, one and they just give up another. They should keep the two promises to the international community. Um, digital uh, cooperation agreement, uh, I would like to take up this issue as one of the uh, core issue for the Parliamentary Friendship League to pursue uh, this agreement. Um, I remember quite vividly about uh, free trade agreement between Japan and Singapore because uh, right before the signing, someone found out there is goldfish industry in Singapore and it delayed the signing for six months. And that was ridiculous. But now we got the CPTPP and RCEP. It's, it's been uh, quite changed uh, in those 20 years. So this digital agreement, I guess we really need to push forward to it. And uh, CPTPP and RCEP, in my mind, it's two totally different things. RCEP is, if I may say, just a trade agreement. But uh, TPP with United States is a rulemaking body for Indo-Pacific. So um, I guess the United States should uh, forget about uh, those new uh, Indo-Pacific whatever body and simply they should come back to TPP. I was very impressed with uh, Mr. Bar uh, Bashkaran's uh, comment because 
as we talk about economic security in Japan, uh, some people are already talking about relocating uh, production out of China to ASEAN countries, say Indonesia or Vietnam, but the capacity is quite different. Uh, but uh, yes, if we could finance infrastructure in ASEAN with excess uh, capital in Japan, uh, I think we could speed up the integration of ASEAN. Uh, in order to convince the Japanese uh, money to go into, invest it into uh, infrastructure, I think we definitely need to show the uh, rule of the law or democracy uh, in those countries. So it would really help uh, promote the common values in those countries. So this is really good uh, idea. And uh, I think we definitely uh, should work with Singapore to nudge ASEAN to go into more integrated, more single uh, market for FDI and, uh, you know, other uh, economic actions. So, um, yes, uh, we need to worry about the China's military expansion, but uh, we need to uh, keep China in the economic system. So we really need to work on China that they, uh, they need to follow the rules. They can participate in the rule making, but once uh, there's order, they have to uh, play the game uh, according to uh, the rules. And the uh, United States, I hope they can be more stable. Uh, they are a bit erratic these days, and uh, we have to worry about China, we have to worry about the United States. Uh, I hope uh, US could create uh, more stable uh, political uh, whatever, so we can uh, work together. Um, and the digital agreement, I would definitely follow up on this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister Kona, especially uh, your uh, strong uh, support uh, given to this idea of uh, uh, Japan's uh, participation or Japan's agreement uh, with Singapore on the digital area. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, there are some other aspects uh, we'd like to discuss, especially you mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, Hong Kong's issues. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, we, we, we support, uh, you know, Chinese integration, economic integration into the region, uh, obviously uh, people would think that uh, what would you do about Hong Kong and some other issues. So the uh, uh, floor is open, and uh, possibly uh, there will be some views and questions uh, among the uh, discussants. Please, if there are any sort of opinions or uh, whatever. None? <laughs> OK, Simon Tay, please. Sasei-san, would you like me to refer to some of the questions in the question answer box on the Zoom? There are some good questions from a representative from yeah. Mitsui. My uh, answer is no good, sir. So. Yeah. Let me quickly uh, summarize these questions, if I may. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think one of the questions that is directed to me uh, is about the Americans' effort with infrastructure, which Japanese are uh, working on, the mm. Build Up Better and the Blue Dot Network. Um, and similarly, there's a question from Walter Sim, a Singaporean correspondent in Tokyo, about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. May I address this briefly and leave the mm. space to others to come with their views? Mm. Um, I think Singapore is very open to working with many partners on these critical issues. The digital, we've talked about. The infrastructure, my colleague and good friend Manu has talked about. Mm. Uh, we realise that the breadth of these undertakings should really be global. But we live in a less than perfect world, so we have to partner with different people. Having said that, regarding the US itself, I think what Kono-san has said is very wise. Two administrations ago, they made the TPP the centerpiece of their economic engagement. For various American reasons, they come back to the region wanting to engage again 
but with different formats. I would say without being impatient, we need to wait some for some details. Uh, I, I would say Singapore has always been a friend of America and we will be open to any requests. But presently, after Commerce Secretary Raimundo's visit through Singapore, I, I'm still waiting for some of these details to emerge. And, and then of course, we should be open to these various collaborations. Uh, our region does need every single partner to work together positively. That open, inclusive region is something I still strongly believe in, even in the midst of the Sino-American tensions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, there are lots of, uh, actually, uh, questions uh, on my table. Um, uh, the, uh, I would uh, read the, some of the questions. Uh, uh, what about uh, establishing a regular meeting uh, between the ASEAN, Quad uh, countries, which support FOIP corporations? And this is uh, former ambassador to Singapore, uh, Ambassador Hashimoto. Anyone would like to respond to this? Okay, Kikuchi Sensei, please. Yeah, you know, the, I'm not sure we could uh, succeed in establishing a regular uh, meeting between ASEAN and Quad, but you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, I strongly hope, you know, Japan, Singapore, you know, looking for some ways of, you know, promoting dialogue between the Quad member countries and, you know, ASEAN. And uh, so I think, you know, that, you know, could, you know, quite productive both the you know, Quad and ASEAN. So I, I think, you know, that is my own views on that. On that. So just you know, start the explore, you know, explore the possibility of the future cooperation, collaboration between the Quad and ASEAN. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kaur. Uh, yeah, last time you were expressing concern about uh, Quad, mm. and uh, ASEAN would never be associated mm. or part. Mm. of quad what's mm. your view on this one respond um mm. i think ASEAN has not made up its mind mm. on what it should do with quad mm. there are different views in the family mm. some members of the ASEAN family feel that quad is a reality it's not going to go away it can provide uh, public goods a region. There's no reason why ASEAN shouldn't work with Quad on specific mm. projects and in specific areas. Other members of the ASEAN family say Quad is a strategic organization and what unite Quad is the common opposition to China. And as you know, the Chinese Foreign Minister Huang Yi has once described Quad as the NATO of the Indo-Pacific. This is not helpful because if China, if China puts an ideological um, slant on Quad, this will make ASEAN more hesitant mm. to cooperate with Quad because we, we want to maintain our neutrality <clears throat> between the two superpowers, the United States and China. And if one of them said, don't touch Quad, it, it is an organization targeted at China. This will make some members of the ASEAN family reluctant to, to work with Quad. So I, I hope you understand that, that there's a variety of view within the ASEAN family. I think there's been no decision yet on whether ASEAN can or cannot work with Quad. Yes, please, mm. Professor Tay. I, I would add to this by saying that I think what we heard today is very helpful to hear people and the experts in the room talk about Quad as developing public goods for the region. It's very reassuring. But on the other hand, whenever Quad is mentioned, an even newer initiative, ACUS, comes up. And whether you conjunct them, some people do get the impression that Quad is a disguised strategic 
alliance of some kind. So I think we will wait, need, not Singapore, but ASEAN will need to wait for more clarification from the court members about what their true intention is. Uh, I am comforted though that each of the court members are individually very valued members of already engaged with ASEAN in the East Asia Summit. So I think there's a lot of fruitful area we can all work together without necessarily having a new mechanism. And I, I think, I, I don't know about your leaders, but I think too many mechanisms uh, tend to clog up uh, the, 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 the true dialogue. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, you know, as uh, Kikuchi Sensei said that uh, this quad at this moment include uh, bilateral Mini, minilateral, hmm. trilateral, and uh, not really uh, moving toward the, the alliance per se in the traditional terms. It's more soft gathering of the like-minded country to try to sustain the regional, hmm. you know, uh, rule-based order of the thought, hmm. and also solicit some collaborations hmm. on some of the specific interests of the countries involved. And then that would include, of course, the support and collaboration with the individual and collective ASEAN. Yeah. I would, uh, yes, please. Uh, Ambassador, uh, please. Yeah, can I make another point? The point I want to make is that all members of ASEAN are united in defending the important role that ASEAN plays at the convener of regional dialogue and processes. They are worried that the evolution of organization like Quad AUKUS trilaterals will undermine ASEAN centrality. So this is a concern that I want to share with Professor Kikuchi. I hope you understand that from ASEAN's point of view, mm. the emergence of all these organizations uh, could threaten our centrality, you know, and make us mm. less relevant and take away our role as the driver in the bus, you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, Kikuchi Sensei. Yeah, uh, Ambassador Ko, you know, I uh, fully understand, you know, the variety of views among ASEAN countries on Quad. But at the same time, you know, the old Quad member countries and also Quad, you know, the meeting, you know, formally mentioned, we respect for ASEAN centralities. So I think, you know, the, through the dialogue between Quad and ASEAN, ASEAN can check what ASEAN centrality means for Quad. You know, we are not uh, any intention to undermine ASEAN centralities. So as I mentioned in my presentations, collaboration between Quad and ASEAN could contribute to for ASEAN's initiative to better work in the Indo-Pacific. And also, of course, you know, Quad takes sometimes, you know, quite tough position against China, but only at the time of China taking deviant behavior against international rules. No, not, you know, every Chinese actions. Only, you know, China take uh, some uh, deviant behavior against international rules, like, you know, South China Sea or some others. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Kikuchi Sensei. Minister Kono, you, you raise your hand, please. Uh, yes, if Foreign Minister Wang Yi says, don't touch it, then if ASEAN cannot touch it, uh, what is uh, ASEAN centrality? Uh, ASEAN need to have <laughs> independent voice yeah. and ASEAN need to do whatever it feels uh, good for ASEAN regardless who says what. So I was a bit worried about Ambassador Ko's comment. And uh, yes, Quad, uh, we are looking at China because China has been obviously violating international rules and it need to be checked. So someone has to stand up and say, you are violating the rules. And uh, I think the international community need to make them pay some cost uh, once they deviate from the established rules. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, quad is important as well as AUKUS. And just like United Kingdom is joining AUKUS and they are trying to come mm. to TPP, I think we need to bring in Europe mm. uh, to Indo-Pacific. Mm. France says they are mm. Indo-Pacific country because they have Tahiti, New Caledonia and other you know, territory. And uh, we welcome that. So uh, we need to look at Chinese political uh, issue as well as economic uh, benefit uh, for having China. Mm. Uh, so that's two separate issue, but it's mm. intertwined. And uh, when I came to ASEAN Plus meetings, I mean, most of the Quad members are already there. So we don't mm. need to build another layer on top of the current things. That's my comment, thank you. Mm. Can I okay, uh, I'm about to go. <laughs> yeah. I, um, thank you, I want to reply to uh, Melissa Kono. I want to explain to him and our Japanese colleagues mm. that there's a fundamental difference mm. between Japan and ASEAN. And unless you understand this, you will not understand our attitude towards Quad. Japan is an ally of the United States. In a rivalry between the United States and China, you are not neutral but partisan. You are allied with the United States against China. ASEAN is fundamentally different. We are independent, but we are neutral. And our value to the world is that because we are independent and neutral, we are therefore acceptable to all the great powers. This is why we are given the privilege of acting as the convener and chairman of the region's forums and processes. The moment we become partisan, we will no longer be able to play this important role. So yes, we are independent, but we are neutral. You may be independent, but you are not neutral. You are a partisan. So I hope you understand that there's a fundamental difference between where the United States is, where Japan is, and where ASEAN is vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I do recognize the difference between the uh, friendly relationship and the alliance relationship. Uh, but still, I un understand that uh, ASEAN, uh, while moving cautiously, has uh, really tried to keep the relationship with the United States uh, in terms of a balance in the power in the region. Mm -hmm. So for that, uh, on that score, I, I, I think what the Kikuchi-san was trying to say is that uh, uh, this one, uh, this uh, not only uh, AUKUS, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, four countries uh, gathering could work in the future, uh, the potential deterrence. So I think, uh, of course, that uh, the ASEAN perspective, uh, we do understand, but uh, that's my opinion. Uh, there, there are some other questions. Uh, Minister Kono, I know that uh, there is a time limit to you, but there is a question uh, uh, posed uh, uh, to you. Uh, 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 the, there is a question that Japan has a scholarship program for international students. Mm. This could serve as a bridge between Japan and Singapore. Mm. How both countries can do more, basically. Mm. Yes, uh, mm. thank you. We have uh, we have had uh, many scholars and students coming from ASEAN countries and you know other country, and they have been a very strong bridge between Japan and other countries. Right now, because of the COVID, we are closed the door for the scholars and students. I'm working on the Ministry of uh, Education to, you know, let them in. And hopefully uh, we can make some announcement to uh, let them come in the spring or even earlier. Uh, they are a very good asset to us and to the other countries. So we definitely need to keep on promoting, uh, promoting them. And uh, hopefully we can increase the number of those students coming to study in Japan. 
uh, quite a few of them are very fluent in the Jap in Japanese language. And uh, they are not only uh, political or economical, but for culturally, uh, they have played a very strong uh, role of bridging uh, to countries. So we really appreciate them. And thank you, Minister Kono. I think uh, that relate to uh, some of the uh, concerns expressed by uh, uh, Katada Sensei on the Japanese inward looking phenomena of the thought. And uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the encouraging statement. Uh, Katada Sensei, you have a floor, please. May, may, I, may I ask a question to Minister Kono, kind of following up on that? Yeah, sure. Please. So uh, yesterday we had the closed session and there was a concern that there has been decreasing number of Japanese students and, and then people study, well, students studying abroad, people coming outside. And, and we were wondering you know, if there are any kind of turnaround or incentive structures or some ways in which uh, Japanese young people would engage more uh, proactively with the rest of the world, especially Southeast Asia, but beyond. Yes, uh, it is my concern too. Um, we have less and less students going abroad to study. Um, number one, the Japanese corporation are now not sending uh, employees to the business school or law schools. So they have to save money and they have to go on their own. Uh, but th those number are actually uh, slightly increasing. Uh, some people not on the company scholarship, but save money and go on their own. And we would like to encourage that. And hopefully uh, the society would encourage that as well. And we are, we are working on those Japanese corporation to restart you know, sending uh, employees to the foreign uh, universities. Uh, many of them, when they come back, they quit the job and get the, something new. Uh, that, that is, uh, they're, not, they're not giving them meaningful task once they get the MBA. So it's company's problem, not their problem. And we are trying to work on them. And we are trying to promote among the young college students, why don't you go study abroad for a year or go to the uh, master's degree after graduation? Uh, not maybe not so successful, but uh, we need to continue that. Uh, I wanted to go, so I quit uh, Japanese college to go to the States, but my son's quite happy being in Japan. So there's a generational change, but hopefully we'll, we'll see the, you know, turning around. We'll work on that. Thank you. And, uh, my time's up. I have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Kana, for joining us. I wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you again. See you. Well, well, we are coming to the limit of time, and uh, possibly we would uh, conclude the session. But the, the there is uh, one or two more questions. Uh, and uh, the, 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 if I may, uh, if there is anybody who could answer this question from the audience, the question is this, US is preparing for the tr uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Economic Framework. How does this framework coexist with uh, CPTPPP? And this is a Biden, uh, you know, uh, uh, the trade uh, official, uh, was talking much uh, and a regional uh, new framework. It looks like, uh, you know, they are uh, speaking on the digital supply chain or whatever, which I don't know really. But is there anybody who could answer this question? Katada Sensei? Oh, yes, yes. yes. both uh, Simon Tay and Katada Sensei. <laughs> No, no, so far, uh, the news from the White House is it's still very vague. Uh, I hear you know, many things are included, trade facilitation, digital economy, supply chain, you know, many, many of those elements are in it. The kind of politics behind it is that different parts of economic bureaucracy, economic leadership wants different things and they are 
kind of avoiding the most fundamental kind of trade and investment kind of CPTPP type of engagement. And especially until the, the midterm election, I don't think there's anything that's coming really strongly. Meanwhile, they are trying to address again, infrastructure and various other issues to package it in such a way that US can continue to engage in the Indo-Pacific in an economic manner. But there's significant criticism against this kind of flimsy approach to it. But I don't know what Simon has uh, uh, any views on that. May I say something? Yes, I please. Agree. I agree with everything Saori has said because first, she is in America. And secondly, she's a real economist unlike me. I'm a lawyer. Uh, but given the situation, I think it's not a matter to me to wait and see what the Biden administration may do. Of course, we will wait to see what details they come up with. But can we not try to find a path ahead? Government to government, Singapore and Japan, as I said, has led. I think also corporates, many of the Japanese companies are looking at ASEAN, looking at Asia and the region. Can we not find ways to work together in the digital and other spaces at the corporate level? This will also have some challenges. You know, the, the talk about students not coming out to the region uh, is a difficulty if we don't have that cultural, deeper understanding. One of my good friends who runs a business, Zulkifli Bayudin, a former NMP from Singapore, has mentioned this because he does business in the region and with Japanese friends. Uh, we, we need to patch this up. We need to hope that those companies sitting from Japan in Singapore can start again to use Singapore as that base with partners, not just on their own, but with Singapore partners to go out into the region and really work on these issues like digital and finding uh, logistics and things from the ground up. And then perhaps after that, we can help tell Americans uh, what is happening in the region and they will make their own decision. That's very, uh, thank you. That's very interesting. We build up uh, from, from, from this part on and, uh, and uh, suggest the United States to join rather than they work on their own uh, sort of initiative. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I think sometimes they won't listen to us, but if we do what's right for us, at least we do that much. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, uh, we'd like to uh, extend the discussions more, but partly uh, the Secretariat is saying that uh, we are over uh, the uh, planned uh, time frame. So uh, if I may, I would like to uh, uh, conclude uh, uh, this, uh, this session and uh, thank all of you uh, for the active participations and, uh, and also uh, uh, thank uh, for the audience uh, to pose uh, uh, their own questions to make the discussion lively. And, uh, and again, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on to the conclusive sessions. Uh, Ambassador Cole, you are still on the screen. Yes. Okay. I'm here. Well, well, yeah. Closing remarks. Uh, right. You want to say something, possibly, please. Uh, yes. Why don't I just uh, make um, three points? I think we're very privileged at this session to have had. In two important messages from Foreign Minister Hayashi and Foreign Minister Balakrishnan, and also to hear from for former Foreign Minister Kono Taro, who is a, a real friend of Singapore and ASEAN. So let me sum up by making three points. Point number one, both Foreign Minister Hayashi and Minister Kono spoke about the need for our two countries to defend certain fundamental values. And this is in line with what my foreign minister said, which is that Japan and Singapore are natural partners and that we are also like-minded. So what unites us then? I think Foreign Minister Hayashi said three things. We are united in the support of the rule of law the freedom of navigation and free trade. These are three fundamental values that anchor the very close relationship between Japan and Singapore. My second point is to pick up from what Manu Bhaskaran, uh, Professor Sauri Katara and Minister Kono said. 
This is about Japan ASEAN. Next year, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the dialogue relationship between Japan and ASEAN. Japan has been a very old and trusted friend of ASEAN. In the annual survey of public opinion in the 10 ASEAN countries by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, the people of the 10 ASEAN countries trust Japan more than they trust any other country. So you are trusted. There is a well of goodwill for Japan. You are in a good position to work with Singapore to help ASEAN complete its journey of economic integration and have a truly single market. You can, we can work together to help ASEAN build high quality and sustainable infrastructure. We can work together, as Manu suggested, to see how we can strengthen the Chiang Mai Initiative and there are other things we can do. So that's my second point. My third and final point is about the Japan-Singapore relationship. All of us agree that it's a, it's a very good relationship and there's a very high level of comfort and trust between our leaders. There's one spe specific idea that the Singapore side has put forward during this symposium and I'm very happy that Minister Kono support the idea, which is it is high time for Singapore and Japan to conclude a digital partnership agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Ko, uh, for highlighting uh, the uh, very important points of uh, discussions. Uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> we found out uh, in today's uh, discussions. Uh, I can't agree with you more on on the point you raised, uh, especially the uh, value uh, value issues. And we are the good partners, of, of course. And uh, and um, and also uh, uh, thank you for reminding uh, us of the uh, 50 years anniversary of Japan ASEAN relationship. And uh, it, it's uh, good to know that uh, Japan uh, is, is is still or be more trusted by our ASEAN friends. I believe that that, that is not simply because of uh, one or two government effort. It's a consistent effort of uh, uh, two people and, and a successive government many years and uh, to make the re relationship work. Yesterday, there was a reference to Fukuda doctrine. I think that was the beginning of the good friendship. But, but since then, I think there will be a variety of uh, effort, initiative taking place to make uh, uh, our relationship stronger. And Japan, uh, ASEAN, Japan, Singapore, uh, free trade agreement is one thing, but obviously there are more dynamic areas uh, for the potential collaboration, which include uh, the digital agreement you mentioned. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the, all this uh, effort will be supported uh, by respective government. That's why we are having this 1.5, uh, uh, you know, conference. And again, thank you very much uh, for joining. I, I'm very much looking for to see, seeing you next time, uh, face to face, hopefully. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I wish you a good health and safety and a good life. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining.